patients reliably get mammograms done. Uh, they get colon cancer screening done. They get prostate cancer screening done. I mean, we hear about that all the time. Really? Do you ever hear about somebody having like heart screening done? <laughs> no. But it should be done. And and it's easy. Hi, I'm Tamara, and this is Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart. Did you know that every 22 minutes, a Canadian woman dies of a heart attack, but the majority don't have to? Today, I'm joined by Dr. Tara Sedlak. She is one of the few certified women's heart health cardiologists in Canada, and she's a fierce advocate for heart health education. Today, we discuss heart disease as a top killer of women in Canada and why the push to change that is more urgent than ever. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Tara. It's great to see you. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. This is great. Well, you know, I've never, we have not had anyone on this podcast to talk about women's heart health. And I'm actually surprised that we haven't done that yet. So I'm really happy to have you here. And, you know, I've been thinking, I never really worry about my heart because I think I'm too busy worrying about getting cancer or, yeah, I think that's the thing that's always on the top of our minds. Do you find that? I think that's incredibly common. You know, I was just telling someone the other day that most women worry that they're going to die of breast cancer, but in all reality, they're six times more likely to die of heart disease. So we should really start focusing on our heart health in addition to all the other um, uh, you know, health conditions that we can run yeah. across. We have a lot of things to worry about, yeah. <laughs> but it's fu- it's not funny. It's very interesting how what is at the top of our mind isn't even the number one thing that, because uh, every 22 minutes, uh, a woman in Canada dies of a heart attack. Yeah, so significant. So significant and so common and uh, misdiagnosed and under-recognized. And it has been for years. And that's why we get out and we try to advocate for women. So we do hear, you know, the differences. We've heard a lot over the last few years about how, you know, a lot of our medications or health research has always been done on men. Um, That's a whole other conversation. But when it comes to heart health and heart disease and, and risk factors... Has it always been based on research of men also? Traditionally, unfortunately, yes, most of it was. And I would say that's up until the last 10 to 20 years. Really, over two-thirds of research, and and likely more in the past, was done on men. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, Some of it is that um, women were just never asked to be part of research studies because uh, it was thought that when women didn't get heart disease, Part of it is that women didn't necessarily volunteer for these types of activities. They're busy, they remain busy, take care of a lot of obligations in the household uh, with children, aging grandparents, and then work. And so then on top of that, you know, volunteering for research um, is, is extra added time. And then finally, sometimes they would not meet criteria for the study. So, and what I mean by that is, um, women are ten, uh, usually 10 years older um, on average by the time they get heart disease. And at that point, sometimes they have other diseases as well. They may have had cancer. They may have had kidney disease. And so then, unfortunately, some research protocols would exclude those women uh, because they were, quote unquote, not healthy enough for the research study. Um, and they would not be included. So we're really trying to change all of that. Mm. So tell me, I mean... A uh, man's heart and a woman's heart are the same, just different sizes, or they're the same. But how does it? How are we different? Yeah, I think there's so many ways. Um, so, first of all, yes, there is a, a difference in size. Um, we have smaller size blood vessels, and so uh, interestingly, we're actually more likely than men to get a condition called small vessel disease. So traditionally. A lot of people have thought, and most people have thought, that when you have heart disease, it's due to um, blockages in the large blood vessels surrounding the heart, the so-called jammer in the heart where you have 100% blockage and there's no blood supply to the heart, and then that causes a heart attack. Well, lo and behold, when we did research, 10% of the time after a heart attack and up to 30% of the time in chest pain, when we looked to uh, see whether there was big blood vessel disease in women, there was not. 
And so for the longest time, the women were told, well, you had a heart attack. Well, we think you had a heart attack, but actually we can't find the cause or maybe you didn't have the heart attack altogether because your arteries look normal. And they would be told, you know, go see your gastroenterologist, have a scope to see if your chest pain could be um, gastric. Um, go see your psychologist or psychi psychiatrist. Maybe this is all anxiety. When in fact, now we have specialized testing and we know that a lot of that was due to disease down into the small blood vessels of the heart, blockages, spasm of the small blood vessels causing chest pain and heart attacks. Mm. Now, I know that women, um, and I've had my own experiences, I think all women have, where you will go and uh, if something doesn't feel right, you go to the doctor and you're told that, oh, it's fine. Like, you're fine. You're too young. You're too this. You're too that. It's, you know, whatever it might be. How often or does it happen where a woman thinks she's having a heart attack or something's not right, goes to emergency and is sent home? Is that something that happens to women who are experiencing um, heart attacks or? Yeah. Yeah. So certainly that was more common in the past um, where it was fairly common where a woman would come in would experience chest pain, maybe not have all the testing done or some of the testing wouldn't show um, whether she'd had a heart attack or not and would be sent home. Um, I think in the last 10 years, we've done a lot of advocacy to try and improve that. And I definitely think that we have. Having said that, I can tell you not that long ago, a few months ago, I came across a woman who told me her horrific story. She was 45 and she um, had a history of anxiety, but was otherwise healthy. And she was at home one night and she felt crushing chest pain across her chest and uh, lasted for more than 30 to 60 minutes. And she took a Tums and it didn't help. And she tried to like see whether she thought it was anxiety and really it felt different than her usual anxiety. So she called the EMS and they came to her house and um, they uh, assessed her, uh, but felt that she was having an anxiety attack, a panic attack, did not bring her into the emergency room. And she thought, oh my gosh, okay, I've totally miscalled this. Um, I'll just take it out of van. And uh, she did. And uh, a couple hours later, she was still having terrible chest pain down her arms, up into the, her jaw, which are more classic signs. And um, she recalled the ambulance, thankfully, um, you know, good for her. And the second set of um, EMS brought her into the hospital and she was having a, a massive heart attack. And by then, you know, we always say, uh, you know, time is muscle that by then, you know, a lot of damage had been done. And so I heard her story and I just said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, we're really trying to change this and I don't hear that story that much anymore. So it's still occurring, but certainly not as often. Mm. So maybe we could talk about what some of the signs are of uh, a heart attack, because I mean, I've seen the commercials before on TV or, you know, I've heard people talk about it. I, I never hear women talk about their heart health. I, I just don't. Um, maybe it's because I, I, yeah, it's just, I never hear it. And so it scares me because I think, oh, it would be really obvious if you're having a heart attack. Like super obvious. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what one would think. But at the end of the day, we found some differences. And still, the number one symptom of a heart attack in both men and women is chest pain. So if you have chest pain and it's different and it's severe, you need to take note of that. Um, but what we know is two things. One is that women can have other signs and symptoms. And so it sometimes confuses the picture where they can get pain in their jaw. In fact, some of my women who've had heart attacks, it was only in their jaw. And they said, geez, for hours, I thought I had a toothache and it was a heart attack. Um, or they can get pain through to their back. And they thought, geez, I was just having, uh, you know, a backache when lo and behold, it was a heart attack, pain down the arms. Um, and then they can also get shortness of breath, uh, feel sweaty, feel fatigued. And, and that can confuse the picture of thinking, geez, maybe I just have the flu. Um, and then the other thing that we found through our own research is that women describe their symptoms differently. So men, classically, it's like the elephant on the chest and sort of crushing. And when we look at it, when we look through research and how women had actually described their chest pain to the EMS or to the emergency room, sometimes they describe it differently. They might describe it more as tightness um, or as a bit of pressure or tightness. And um, 
you know, unfortunately, physicians may hear that differently and think, oh, well, tightness, maybe that's just anxiety or that's just a lung thing or uh, maybe you're just having asthma. And so I think it confuses people. And so I think we have to have a low threshold um, uh, for, uh, you know, examining these symptoms and think about some of these other symptoms that are involved and really take note. So some of the symptoms you just explained, I mean... I'm in menopause and I think I feel all those things all the time, right? And I think a lot of us do. And that's the other thing is that, you know, when we talk about symptoms or what we might feel, um, and you were just talking about how that can confuse things. And I can see that because, you know, whether you, after you have a baby, your body changes so much. Uh, when you go through menopause, you're feeling all kinds of things that you never felt before. When, like, does, do going through those big life um, things like menopause or pregnancy, does that affect our heart too? Is that all related to our heart or? Yes, definitely. So hormones plays a big role. Um, so first of all, during pregnancy, uh, there's a lot of things that can take place. It really is a window into a woman's heart health where uh, women can be at risk for conditions during pregnancy. For example, gestational diabetes. So diabetes only during pregnancy, but not necessarily after or before. Or high blood pressure during pregnancy. Again, not necessarily before or after. Or preeclampsia, which is sort of toxemia where you can get uh, elevated liver enzymes and more swelling than we're used to and neurological symptoms. And, and so all of those conditions during pregnancy, should a woman suffer those, that actually doubles her risk for cardiovascular disease many years later. So 10, 20, 30 years later, that greatly increases her risk if she's had that um, uh, during pregnancy. And I can tell you that my colleagues and uh, my friends are not asking about that. We're asking about traditional risk factors, you know, smoking, diabetes, obesity, exercise, we're not asking about pregnancy. And so now when I'm teaching the medical students and the residents, I'm trying to tell them, we've got to ask into pregnancy because it's a window into a woman's heart health. And you may think, geez, a woman is low risk because she doesn't have any of the traditional risk factors in yet. She had gestational diabetes and she had high blood pressure during pregnancy. Well, right there, we need to take you know more interest in that, follow her up more regularly, and uh, perhaps do some testing at a younger age if she has signs or symptoms. And then same thing about menopause. Um, you know, uh, during menopause, of course, estrogen and progesterone drop. Estrogen felt to be protective when women are younger, protective of blood vessels, protective of heart. And then when those levels drop, then your cholesterol can, can go up, your blood pressure can go up. I've definitely had patients who said, geez, my blood pressure was low my whole life. And now suddenly it's high. I don't quite understand this. I said, well, when, when did you go through menopause? Oh, geez, uh, you know, I had my last period a year ago. You know, so so those types of changes can increase cholesterol, can increase blood pressure, and other changes inside a woman's heart, and and that puts you at higher risk. And so you can imagine that if you went through premature menopause, um, which is considered anyone under the age of forty, uh, so premature ovarian failure, that greatly increases a woman's risk because uh, she's really not had those protective effects for many many years. Wow, I had no idea, um, and. I, I, you know, something that you were just talking about, like when we were talking about symptoms and what, you know, are, how they're so different and s can be very subtle. In in your experience, do you find that women are, I mean, for lack of a better word, I'll use the word stoic. And by that, I mean, um, we're so we're doers, right? Like we're doing things and working and families and whatever friends and getting stuff done, cleaning. I do a lot of cleaning. And you know, you're you kind of set your own pain aside, or you're looking after everybody else, or you don't want to complain because you got to go do this, this, and this, or whatever it might be. And I, I do see this with my own friends and like lots of women actually where it's like, oh, I'll just take a, you know, I'll just take a, an Advil or whatever because I have a, a headache, it's fine or whatever. Do you find that, that we tend to just soldier on? Yeah, I think that's incredibly common. And in fact, when I talk to women and say, geez, when do you actually think that your symptoms began? Uh, and they would go back and say, you know, I actually think it started a year or two ago. I just pushed through it. I thought that it was maybe heartburn. 
thought it was maybe a bit of anxiety. I thought maybe I was working too hard, had little bits of chest pain here and there, couldn't get through my exercise routine like I used to. Um, but I just, uh, I just didn't think it, number one, they didn't think it could be their heart. And number two, uh, they just didn't want to believe it. And so kind of, as you said, soldiered on, pressed onwards, continued onwards until something more major occurs or they end up in the emergency room or they end up seeing their family doctor and their family doctor's alarmed um, that these things are brought to light. So I think that's incredibly common. And I always tell women, you know, if there's something in the back of your mind uh, that just crosses your mind and you're like, something is not right. You know, women know their bodies. And if something is different, go get it checked out. It may not require the emergency room that day, but get it checked out with your family doctor. Ask them to check your blood pressure. Ask them to check your cholesterol. Get an ECG done. Those are all very, very easy standard tests um, that can at least start the ball rolling. And then obviously, if there's something more serious going on, you know, go on to do further testing. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just mentioned an ECG. Can you explain what that is for people that don't know? Yeah. So an ECG is um, where we put 12 little stickies on the chest and uh, leads, electrical leads, and we look at the heart rhythm. And it can also give us a window into uh, the size of the heart. If someone's had an old heart attack, uh, if there's thickening of the heart, sometimes it will show if there's a lack of blood supply to the heart, there are acute changes. You can see if someone's actually suffering from a lack of blood supply to the heart. So it can give you some information. It certainly is not perfect. And if it's normal and women still have symptoms, definitely have to go on to further testing. But at least it's somewhere to start where, geez, if it was abnormal, that would put you in a certain direction right away and may I expedite things. And it's easy to do and it's inexpensive um, and you can get it done at any life lab. Wow. And what about test, like, what about when we get a blood work done or some of us don't even go and get that done because we think, oh, if there's nothing wrong, we don't need to do that. But should we be checking our cholesterol? Is there a, a point in time when it becomes important to do that? Yeah, great question. So, you know, we write all these guidelines across Canada so that family practitioners know when they should check. And um, the current guidelines say for everybody, men and women across the board, you should get your cholesterol checked starting at age of 40. So just like you're getting your mammogram done, go get your cholesterol done. Now, that, that changes um, depending upon your risk. If you have a, a family history of heart disease at a young age, your mom had a heart attack at 40, you'd want to get that done at a younger age. If you had some of those other risk factors I talked about during pregnancy, um, then you'd want to get it done at a younger age. Uh, and if you had really high cholesterol in the family where you were told, geez, you have genetic high cholesterol in the family, some women get it done in their teens or, or early 20s. It may not change management at that point, they may or may not go on medication for that, depending upon how high it is, but it would certainly cause them to, uh, you know, maybe change their lifestyle, maybe get monitored more frequently, and then certainly perhaps go on medication at some point to try and prevent heart events. So how important is family history? It's extremely important. Uh, it over doubles uh, the risk of heart disease. And typically what we say is premature heart disease, which Technically speaking is, you know, any man in the family who's had a heart event under the age of 55 and any woman in the family who's ha had an event under the age of 65, again, keeping in mind that age difference in terms of when men and women tend to, to have their heart disease onset. Um, but really any heart disease, you know, I think is important and, and women and men are getting older and older nowadays. And so we're seeing heart disease older and older and of course actively treating it because people are otherwise in good shape. And so I think any heart disease in the family is, is extremely important. And, and just knowing your family history is, is really important. So I always ask people, really delve into it, find out what happened. And don't just sort of, you know, oh, my dad had heart disease. What do you mean by that? Because, uh, you know, just having high blood pressure is different than he had a massive heart attack and required bypass surgery at the age of 40. You know, so there are differences in that. Knowing the details really would alarm someone to one and maybe not so much to another. And what do you say to patients who they don't know their family history? They may be adopted. They may, you know, lost their parents at a young age. I mean, I mean, there's just thousands of different scenarios. What if we don't know our family history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so number one, if you're adopted, and actually I had a patient yesterday who was adopted, and I, I said to her, you know, 
is there any way you can still try to find out? And and she said, yeah, I, I sort of have a cursory idea of, of who my mom and dad are. I, I don't have a relationship with them, but I said, you know, can you just ask them for, for your own heart health? So that's the first thing. The second thing is we actually have some newer tests that we can do. When we do a cholesterol panel now, there's a standard cholesterol panel that we do, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. We now uh, know that checking something called an LP little a, which is just at the bottom, at, at the end of the day, is just a lipid marker. Um, but checking that at one time in a patient's life can actually give us a window into their genetic um, uh, risk for heart disease. And so we're actually doing that now. We're checking it in people. And as you said, it could be even more important in somebody who doesn't even know their family history or doesn't know the specifics around their family history and you check it and it's really high, that patient you might become more alarmed about or, or worry more about than someone who's completely normal with no, no family history. So we're developing all of these new risk tools and you can, again, get that done at any lab as part of the workup. And now the guidelines suggest we should do it at least once in our lifetime to try and see whether we have a genetic marker. You just mentioned good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and I've always I've always found that so um, interesting because I I remember saying to my doctor not long ago like oh should I be because you know you can see your you, you can see your blood work now online if you're registered and I'm like oh I I noticed this cholesterol looks high and she goes no that's that's your good cholesterol it's fine and it's not past the blah 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 or whatever it might be and I'm like what does that mean good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Right. It is a little bit confusing because there's all these markers and then there's flags and you know it'll flag when it's high and sometimes when it's high, it's actually good. So there's total cholesterol and total cholesterol is basically the addition of bad and good. So you can imagine that if your bad was high and your good was high, you're going to have a high total. Um, there's bad cholesterol, which is LDL. And that one we pay the most attention to, I would say. There's the most research behind it. There's a direct relationship between how high your LDL is and your risk of heart disease. So we pay the most attention to that. And actually, we can do the most about it. We can get the LDL really low, particularly with medications, but also with diet and exercise. And then there's the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and you want that to be high. And naturally speaking, it's actually higher in women anyway. So we actually have a higher cutoff for um, what's normal and abnormal. We want it to be high. And really, what we know is the only reliable thing that changes HDL and it increases HDL is exercise. We've tried lots of medication to increase HDL. And while we may make the number look better, um, the long-term effects of it are kind of are, are, are not that great um, in terms of uh, medications for the HDL. So at the end of the day, you know, LDL is bad and we want it to be lower, lots of medications for that. HDL, we want it to be higher. And really, it's just exercise uh, at the end of the day. Mm. So on our podcast, we like to thank our guests for being here. And so we asked them to choose a Canadian nonprofit. Uh, you chose the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, and we will be giving them $500 as a thank you for you being here. But it, this is this is important to you, the the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance. Can you tell Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's really important to me. So... Um, we started it uh, over five years ago now. It was really exciting at the time. And a bunch of practitioners, allied health, and actually patient partners came together across Canada from every province and territory and said, you know, let's get together, let's form an alliance, and let's advocate for women's heart health. And so we now have over 100 members across Canada, and many of them, as I said, are patient partners or allied health or uh, physicians. And during the month of February, which is Heart Month, we get together and we do a lot of advocacy work. We do a lot of education for the public. We wear red on Wear Red Canada Day, which is February 13th. Very exciting. Uh, day before Valentine's Day. And we do a lot of social media and outreach, just trying to get the message out to women saying, you know, take care of yourself, empower yourself, get on top of your heart health, get out there and exercise um, and really try and take care of yourself. Can you talk to us a little bit about stroke? Because, uh, you know, we always hear, you know, heart and stroke, heart and stroke. And I think that, you know, with a, with a heart attack, I think we can imagine like what that would maybe be like, you know, um, with the descriptions you gave. But what about stroke? What What is a stroke? Yeah, great question. So it's a similar physiology for the most part. Uh, what happens is that one of the blood vessels to the brain um, becomes blocked. 
typically speaking, there is a different type of stroke, which is quite quite a bit less common where there's a bleed in the brain. But, but the standard stroke is where there's a lack of blood supply to the brain by a blockage, typically some sort of a cholesterol blockage or a clot. And then that area of the brain starts to die off. And so you want to get on top of it quickly. And there's been a lot of outreach, particularly by heart and stroke, but by other advocacy groups as well, saying, geez, if you're starting to have signs and symptoms, you're noticing uh, some drooping of the face. Uh, you're not, a, you know, you're having really abnormal vision signs, blackness uh, uh, in one eye. You're not able to raise one hand. Um, you have a lot of weird numbness and tingling along one side of your body that's completely different. Um, you know, seek help very quickly because they can actually use clot busters or even procedures in the emergency room or on the neurology ward to, um, to try to treat stroke. And they do a great job of it when you get there early. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to be aware of when it comes to our heart health. What do you, I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, you're, you're really making me think here and reflect on, you know, my own health or how often me and my friends talk about our heart or any, it just doesn't happen. And I'm actually alarmed talking to you now about how we don't really pay attention to the health of our heart. Yes, we know if we go for an exercise, it's good for our heart and all that. But finding healthcare right now, like finding a, a whether it's a GP or trying to go to an emergency if you're feeling like whatever it might be is very difficult everywhere in the country. Um, most lots of people don't even have a family doctor. So, what do we do if we if we're feeling like we are worried about our heart or we don't know if our, if we've never had a cholesterol test. We've never, what's your advice to, um, to women who just don't know where to start? Yeah. I think, you know, starting first of all with, um, making sure that you're, you know, looking at, into, into yourself in terms of the symptoms that you've been experiencing or not experiencing. And of course, taking care of those symptoms if you feel that they're, they're real. Um, number two is doing all of those good things um, like regular exercise, diet. Stress is a huge risk factor for women and we're all feeling stress more than ever, I think, um, particularly post-COVID now. And so just taking care of stress and mental health, I think is very important. And then, as you said, getting some of these baseline testing done. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be through a family doctor. You know, you can go to a walk-in clinic. We don't love going to walk-in clinics. But, you know, if you don't have a doctor, you got to take your own uh, health in your hands and you, you have to get it done somewhere. And so getting cholesterol done, asking them to check your blood pressure, getting an ECG done, um, those types of initial things, and then moving on if there's something more serious and then there is actually um, a workaround way where we, as part of our women's heart program, we have a uh, nurse practitioner led program and nurse practitioners can actually, you can self-refer. And so her name is Dr. Prodan Bella, Bella and um, she runs a nurse practitioner program where women can self-refer and they can get a lot of sort of um, early testing done on their heart. So that's kind of an exciting workaround for women um, who don't necessarily have good ties to a family doctor. But at the end of the day, we really do encourage people to start with, if they have a good family doctor, please start with your family doctor. You really want them in the loop because um, they are aware of the rest of your health as well. Mm -hmm. And this and this really is something that we can be proactive about, right, with our heart. Uh, because like I said, a lot of us aren't thinking about it because there's nothing wrong or everything seems fine. But the more we know, then I guess the the safer will be if something does happen because we'll be able to recognize the signs better. Yeah, I think that's entirely correct. You know, we're equipped with the knowledge of, you know, our family history, of what our cholesterol levels look like, of what our blood pressure looks like, of what our ECG looks like, uh, what the rest of our blood work looks like. And then if you have symptoms, you can take that into context of, okay, well, I know that I'm at higher risk. I know I have a family history. I think I should take this more seriously and I should really uh, look into it, you know, more quickly than than I normally would have. And it's probably a good idea to talk to your, you know, your girlfriends about it, talk to your friends about it, even your guy friends. I mean, you know, heart disease is, it's, is it the number one killer of men also? Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean, it depends upon age and it, it you know, obviously 
cancer is up there as well, and it depends upon the community you look in. But you know, heart disease and cancer are really the the killers. Um, uh, heart attack and stroke and cancer in in Canada, in the U.S., in North America for sure. And so, just making sure that you get all of those things done. You know, I think I think cancer oncologists have done an amazing job of getting screening done. You know, patients reliably get mammograms done. Uh, they get colon cancer screening done. They get prostate cancer screening done. I mean, we hear about that all the time. Really? Do you ever hear about somebody having like heart screening done? <laughs> no. But it should be done. And and it's easy um, just to even get those risk factors checked out and know whether or not you're at risk or not, right? Um, it's easy. It's just, it's not done. And people are busy and, and family practice is busy and everyone is busy. And so I think it gets missed a lot of the time and just isn't recognized. And so I think both men and women need to really be aware of this. Yep. Be aware, advocate for yourself, talk to everybody about it because what, what one person is feeling, your friend might be feeling the same thing or something completely different and you might discover something about each other, right? Or about your own health. Um, you know, as we as we wrap up, you mentioned February 13th, the Wear Red Canada Day. Um, I know that February is a big month for heart health and awareness of our, you know, the, the health of our hearts. Um, what advice do you have people as we as we, you know, sign off here and and move into February? What would you like to see, you know, uh, us do in Canada to to be more aware yeah, great question. I really want people to start talking about it, just like you and I are talking about it today, but talking about it with your friends, talking about it with your family doctor, talking about it with your family. People just don't talk to their family. And a lot of people come in and say, geez, I've never actually asked my parents whether they have heart disease. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you didn't ask them? So just, just start talking about it. Talk about it on social media. Uh, talk about it in the media. Um, just really get the word out that this is important. It's preventable. 90% of heart disease is preventable through, you know, not smoking, exercising regularly, taking care of your stress levels, taking care of your blood pressure, taking care of your diabetes if you have diabetes, making sure your cholesterol is normal, you know, making sure your diet is good, you know. So all of those things we can do on a regular basis. We're just, I think, not tuned in to it. And I think we're so busy that it just isn't at the forefront of our mind. But now, you know, heart month throughout February. February 13th, on that day, wear red that day. Um, most of my friends and family will be wearing red on that day, day before Valentine's Day, just to think about it, remember it, make sure you get your heart checked and make sure you get all your risk factors looked at. Tara, thank you so much for this. It's been a really enlightening conversation and a good reminder, right, that we yeah. we need to be more open and transparent and and just talk more about our hearts and and our health. Your website is Dr. Tara Sedlak, D R T A R A S E D L A K dot com. And you are on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, at women two underscores and then heart. So at women two underscores and heart. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. I think this was great. Thanks for listening to another episode of TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. Be sure to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for another conversation. You can also check out our website, telus.com slash podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TELUS Talks.